Item number SCP-051. Index, Japanese Obstetrical Model. Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-051 and SCP-051-A are to be kept in a sealed containment facility. SCP-051-A is kept within a locked, climate-controlled document box with a viewing window to prevent degradation of its material. Any personnel, with the exception of pregnant or non-sterile female personnel who might not be aware of an early-stage pregnancy, may access SCP-051 as long as a request is placed beforehand and cleared by site administration. Description SCP-051 is a 25-centimeter, 10-inch, anatomically correct model of a human female, carved out of ivory, with typically Asian features. Microscopic analysis shows that the head hair is human hair. The doll is jointed at the shoulders, hips, and knees. The stomach area of the doll is fully removable as a cap of ivory, exposing a detailed ribcage and organs and a 2.5 centimeter, one inch, ivory fetus connected to the main figure by a leather cord umbilicus. When brought into the presence of a pregnant human female, SCP-051 has various deleterious effects upon the pregnancy, generally resulting in miscarriage of the fetus. Reports include a gentle compulsion to handle the model, open its stomach cap, and take out the fetus. This results in nausea and cramping within five minutes, vaginal bleeding that begins as spotting and may progress to hemorrhage within the next half hour, and miscarriage within two through twenty-four hours in most recorded cases. Medical records indicate that the aborted fetuses bear moderate to severe defects. Pregnancies carried to term after exposure to the model have resulted in severely deformed live births, including deaths of the mother and infants terminated after birth by the delivering physician. See interview 051-1 below. Witnesses to these live births showed signs of severe emotional trauma that was alleviated after foundation interviews by administration of a Class A amnestic. SCP-051-A is a fragment of text on rice paper that was discovered with SCP-051. The surviving text is written with plant-derived ink, test dated to the 12th century, and the characters have been identified as a known early dialect of Japanese. Translation reveals the text is part of a prayer or spell against demons that attack unborn babies. The incantation orders these forces or demons into the model, instead of a pregnant woman, and claims to trap them there. However, centuries have degraded the paper and ink so that the full incantation and instructions, if any, cannot be deciphered. Addendum SCP-051 and SCP-051-A were discovered in a box of early Japanese artifacts delivered anonymously to the Museum in 1938. After 60 years and a number of incidents resulting from contact by female secretaries, researchers, and students, an agent on staff in the museum's archives learned of its properties and obtained it for foundation study. Interview 051-1 Interviewed Dr. David Ehrenfeld Interviewer Agent Forward Dr. Ehrenfeld was the attending physician at the death of Martha Roth. Museum 02 January 1942 This interview was conducted off-site as Dr. Ehrenfeld was a resident of nursing facility. At the time of interview, he was 95 years old and physically infirm, though retaining most of his mental faculties. A Class A amnestic was administered after the interview. Begin log October 20. Interviewer. Thank you for seeing me, Doctor. Dr. Ehrenfeld. You are welcome. I have outlived most people who would care to hear such stories. Then again, they surely would have thought I was telling lies or slipping into dementia. Now, you may think the same, but at my age, I do not care. Thin laughter. Can you tell me what you remember of the events of January 2nd, 1942? It was an ugly day. Cold and ugly. Can be a wonderful city sometimes, but winter is a bad season. It was late in the evening when my housekeeper told me I had been called. 
I was tired, but a birth is always a wonderful experience. I thought it would cheer me. Coughing, sound of the doctor sipping liquid. I had a nurse with me, but the girl never came back to my office after that night. Fifteen minutes, perhaps, for the cab to reach the museum from my house. I'm not certain, but I think so. The doorman was waiting for me. He led me to the room where they had poor Mrs. Rook laid out on a low table covered with some canvas ground cloths, I think, to make her more comfortable. What was her condition when you arrived? Thinking back now, I should have realized it was very bad. But I was young and had not much experience. She was quiet and only grunted with each contraction. She did not respond when I checked her vital signs and spoke to her. She did not even look at me. There was quite a bit of blood. A gush of it covered my hands as I reached down to begin helping her with the birth. The floor was slick with it underneath her, and the baby had not crowned yet. She was dilated well, and the contractions were quite close together, and this made me fear she may be having a breech birth. I showed a calm face, though I did not want to panic my nurse or the researcher, Dr. Merrill, who was nearby, a dignified older man. I believe I wanted to impress him. A pause, breathing sounds, more sipping. And then, Doctor? I was concerned because of all the blood that her life was in danger. I told her to push, and she was pushing, and my nurse helped her, putting downward pressure on the abdomen as I attempted to manually aid the infant's emergence. I will spare you the details of a breech birth procedure. It can be found in any obstetrics manual of the time. I probed blindly and felt... I thought it was the coil of the umbilicus, perhaps tangled around the baby's neck. I almost withdrew, thinking that an episiotomy would be required, but she tore before I could proceed. There was more blood, and the baby began to emerge into my hands. A pause. I had never seen such a thing. You are a researcher. Do you know much of the common cephalic birth defects? This was uncommon. I thought at first that the infant must be stillborn. Its flesh was grey, not the vernix-covered grey of a normal birth, but lifeless and degraded, the smell of decay. I recoiled, and the poor mother screamed on her last push, and the infant was delivered into my arms with a great rush of hemorrhage, the deformity, unspeakable. The thoracic cavity was completely open, the limbs. But it wasn't a stillbirth. It looked at me. I heard the nurse above me, beginning resuscitation attempts, then heard her gasp and falter as she saw what I held, gagging as the smell filled the room. I tried to drop the creature, but it clung to my hands. I felt my skin begin to blister and crack. Strange how clearly I can remember it. At my age, sometimes I cannot even remember what I had for dinner. The infant was almost double the length of a normal viable fetus at eight months, its lower body segmented. Coughing, almost choking, a pause of two minutes while the interviewer assists Dr. Ehrenfeld with a nearby oxygen mask. What did you do then? It began to laugh, and I killed it. A pause. I broke its neck while it looked at me. Were there ever any questions or consequences? Thin laughter. In 1942, with the country at war and two respected professional men to give their testimony. No. The museum building had a furnace. I disposed of the infant's body myself. We claimed some more normal defect had taken the lives of mother and child. The husband was a drunkard and cared for nothing but her life insurance policy. I believe he was drafted shortly thereafter and died somewhere in France and I left my practice almost immediately. I never delivered another child. End log. Closing statement. Dr. Ehrenfeld expired four months later of pneumonia.